tell him right now and declare it over your life. Jesus, have your way. God, have your way over my life right now. In Jesus' name. Have your way, Jesus. Open up your mouth and use your heavenly prayer language right now and just begin to pull on heaven. Come on, just begin to stir up the gift of God within you right now. There's angels all over this room worshiping. They're worshiping in this room. They're worshiping in heaven.
We decree and we declare that you would have your way. You would have your way in this house. You would have your way in every individual home. And that your power, your glory would be manifested everywhere we go. And every, everything that we put our hands to, God, would be for your glory. Over the angels tonight, we cry, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. There's no other thing that we can say in moments like this but holy, holy, holy. So, Lord, we thank you for being holy. We thank you for being kind. We thank you for being loving. We thank you, Father, for everything that you've done. We thank you for everything that you're doing, Lord, and for what is to come. And we give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. And we give you all the praise and everybody in this place tonight said amen and amen and amen. Give your Lord one shot of praise tonight. Come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Love upon somebody as you're seated in his presence tonight.
We just want to extend a huge welcome to all of our first time guests. Thank you so much for joining us. Please visit the Welcome Center after service so we can get you your free gift. If this is your first time watching online, send us a message and we'll be sure to get you your free gift for being with us today. Do you ever doubt that Christianity is true? Do you ever think the atheists are right when they claim that reason and science points toward atheism and there's too much evil in the world so there can't be a good God? Well, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And I'm coming to your area to show why truth exists, why God exists, why miracles are possible, and why the Bible is reliable. And there will be plenty of time for questions. I hope you can come. Here are the details. You do not want to miss that Sunday night, March 19th at 6 p.m. It's going to be an incredible night. If you've not been uh, you know, exposed to Dr. Frank's uh, ministry and, and who he is and what he does, please go look him up on sh social media. Check him out online, and you will be impacted, I promise you, by, by all that he does and who he is and, and the gift of God that he is uh, to the kingdom. Amen. If you don't want to miss it, it's going to be incredible. Let's prepare to honor God the giving of his tithe and our offering tonight. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. A servant leader will get one to you, and it is good to be back with you in the house. I tell you. It's good to get away. You know, if we didn't, if, if we, it's good to be back. If, if we didn't get away at this time, we would have been the next seven months not being able to go anywhere. Baseball starts, and it starts from uh, Monday um, all the way through uh, September. So we had to do it now. So, you know, it was good to get away and, and see uh, family and friends. And, and um, um, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry that y'all had two snowstorms while we were gone. I feel really <laughs> bad. And... Um, you know, I was looking at the weather, and I was like, oh, Lord, you are so good. God, you are so good. You know, and, uh, you know, but, oh, my goodness. Everybody well? Amen. Tell somebody next to you, say, you look good tonight. You look good tonight. Encourage them. You know, when you see somebody walk in, just encourage them and say, you look good tonight. Amen. Those of you who are watching online. If you're sick, we're believing for your healing. If you're out of town, we're praying for your safety, your protection, and whatever God is doing in your life. I know a lot of people are, are still battling stuff, and they're still sick. And, and I just, Father, I pray right now healing over everybody that is sick. From the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, Lord, whatever that sickness is, whatever that illness is, God, whatever that infirmity may be, that by your stripes... Right now, Father, we decree that they are healed in Jesus' name. We thank you for touching their body. We thank you, Lord, for moving miraculously upon their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, let's stand. Let's prepare to sow these gifts into this incredible atmosphere tonight. I tell you, I mean, when, you know, when, when I don't know about you, but you just have fun worshiping. I just love worshiping. Just have fun worshiping. You know? Worship should not be a laborsome thing. I mean, it should be something that we love doing. It's an honor to give God praise. It's an honor to worship him. We're going to be doing it for all of eternity, so we might as well get used to it and learn to like it. Amen? God is so good. Father, I thank you for every tithe, every offering, every seed that's being released in this atmosphere tonight, God. Move heaven over these seeds tonight. We honor you for it right now in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. And amen. Would you sow those gifts tonight? somebody next to you here we go we gotta do that song we haven't done that song in like like a hundred years that's like you know i didn't have any gray hair last time we did that song we should do that song you know before before we left um we had a snowstorm coming in you know we try to you know look at the forecast and everything and i was ready to, to finalize this series that we've been talking about warfare and and um uh, talking about angels and i wanted to do this message and and then, you know, we, we weren't sure if the snowstorm was going to hit, so we, you know, erred on the side of caution because we didn't want people driving home in the middle of a snowstorm. And, and so, you know, service got scrubbed. But, 
And I, I was like, you know, do I do, do I finish that? Do I start something new? What do I do? And I'm kind of like that guy, you know, when you color the picture and, or you're watching somebody color and they leave that portion uncolored and they like, they like say it's done. Yeah, I'm that guy who looks at that piece that's uncolored and, you know, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta fix it. I gotta finish it. I gotta, it's gotta be done. So that's kind of how I feel about this. So let me finish and wrap up this thing so I can, I can get to a, into a new series. But um, I want to finish this series on warfare and finish this thing on angels. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. I want to pull something out right here. The Bible says that the earth was without form and void and that the Spirit was hovering. You can have the Holy Spirit and still have chaos. Look now. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. A lot of people attend churches that are full of the Holy Spirit, but they don't have any word. And nothing came to order until God spoke. The Spirit of God was already present, but there was still no order. Because it's not unless you have the Spirit and you have the life and the structure that go together. See, there's a lot of people that believe in God, but their life has no structure. And so their life is still full of darkness. There are people that shout on Sunday, but come Monday, they're a hot mess. Come on. And so Jesus could not get order into the earth until he started releasing words into the earth. And although the Holy Spirit was present to energize the atmosphere, God had to say something. And then when God said it with the presence of the Holy Spirit, that atmosphere became energized and all of a sudden creative miracles begin to take place. We've got to understand that creative miracles can happen if we would just open up our mouth and begin to speak in faith the word of God. Amen? So the Bible says in verse 2, the earth was without form and, the, and void and darkness was upon the face of the earth. Isaiah 45, 18 says this, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Isaiah 45, 18. I did not create the earth to be void. I did not create the earth in vain. I created the earth to be lived in. The problem that we just read is the earth was without form and void. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 is an absolute mess. Verse 2, it's not livable. Many scholars believe that Something happened between verse 1 and verse 2. The Bible says that when God created the heavens and the earth, they were not without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. God did not create something out of the gate that was a mess and needed to be revisited. Something happened after God created, and what happened was catastrophic. Now, there are three major angels in heaven that form the holy trinity of angels, so to speak. Number one, there's Michael the archangel. Michael is the warring angel. Whenever there's a war, Michael is over all the warring angels. There are ranks of angels. And if you, if you, if you, if you study this, you'll find nine ranks of angels. There are ranks of angels, depending on how heavy your warfare is, that would determine the rank upon which you could access. That's powerful right there. If you've got big purpose, that means you're going to have big battles. We've got to learn to stop cursing the struggles and the battles and the fights that we have to go through because on the other side of it, God is about to release something into our life. Amen? You can't fight ordinary battles and not have, uh, you can't fight ordinary battles and, and, and not have big battles. Some of what, some, of, some people want big victories, but you only want to fight ordinary battles. That's just not going to happen. Big victories come with big battles. Ordinary victories come with ordinary battles. And those who are fighting for a great destiny, you're going to need a great host of angels to come and help you handle your battles. So there are ranks in angels. But Michael is over all of the warring angels. Gabriel is the messenger angel. Depending on the importance of the message, you access a different messenger angel. And then there was Lucifer. 
Lucifer was over worship. He was over music. The Bible says he had instruments built inside of his person. He didn't play an instrument. He was an instrument. And, and when he walked, music came out of him. We don't, you know, we, we don't know, and it's pure speculation. But evidently, Michael, as many theologians and scholars believe, Michael was to be the right-hand angel because his name means closest or most like God. The Bible makes it clear in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 that the fall of Satan, at the fall of Satan, Satan was offended at this move because the Bible says his heart was lifted up and he was very prideful and he made the comment that he would become the most, like the most high. Revelation 12 says that the great dragon, when he fell, took a third of heaven with him. So evidently, there was a rebellion in heaven between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Nowhere else in the Bible does anyone else know where to place this. So we know sometime out there in eternity that Satan rebelled, was cast out of heaven, him and a third of the angels with him. They are angels, but they become demonic angels, and they're full of darkness. We don't know when, but most people believe between verse 1 and verse 2, because God created the heavens and the earth, he created the earth to be inhabited and did not create it with any vanity. But it's clear right here in verse 2 that it's not able to be inhabited, it's full of darkness, and it has no form, and it's void of life. So to have a rebellion in heaven, you have to understand this is catastrophic. Job Chapter 9, verse 5 says, It is God who removes the mountains. I just remembered that I did not give my scriptures to the, to the folks in the back to put it up on the thing for you. I'm looking up and I'm like, where are the scriptures that I didn't give them to them? So I'm just going to read it to you. That's why tell somebody next to you, bring your Bible. You got to bring your Bible, right? Job chapter 9, verse 5. It is God who removes the mountains. They know not how when he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun not to shine and sets a seal upon the stars, who alone stretches out the heavens and tramples down the ways of the sea. Something happened. Now, Job is the oldest book, all right, the oldest book in the Bible, not Genesis. Everybody know that? Okay. The oldest book in the Bible is Job. Job is describing that there was a time when the stars refused to shine. And it didn't have anything back to do back then with the government clouding up the sky. Let me tell y'all something. From Vermont to Florida, it was nothing but trails and airplanes putting lines all up in the sky. Anybody that says that's just condensation trails, I watched it. 1,300 miles from Vermont to Florida, right? Did we not? I mean, the whole way down, the planes are dropping stuff. That was a great question. <laughs> the, the stars refused to shine. And the earth was shaken out of its foundations. The heavens were removed out of their places. The water didn't know where to stop, and they began to cover the face of the earth. He is recalling a time when this happened. And the oldest sage in the Bible is saying that there was a time when something catastrophic happened in heaven, and it shook everything that God had created out of its normal form and out of its normal place. And I happen to believe that it is the time when Satan said, I want to be God. I don't want to worship God. I want to be worshipped. And I think that's why now he is so powerfully, demonically involved in music because he wants all of us to worship him. And so where we make music with filthy lyrics and we give them billions and billions of dollars with God's money and make them famous, he's now getting what he couldn't get in heaven. He's getting your worship. Sometimes it's hard to shout when, you know, someone's standing on your foot. But just let that rest on you. That's why people get uncomfortable in worship sometimes on, uh, in worship services because the only thing they can do is try to ignore what's happening. And they talk and they become distracted until it's over. It's because there's something else that's consumed that space that belongs to God. Now, I don't know how long the earth remained in that condition, but I know it only took God five days to, to fix it. 
Somebody needs to know God, it doesn't take God that long to fix it. Amen? Come on. I don't know how long you've been in that condition, but it doesn't take God very long to fix it. He can take things that are without form and void, and he can take the darkness in your life, and if you give him a little bit of time and you pour some word in it, the word will take the whole thing and turn it around. At the entrance of thy word, it giveth light, the Bible says. I don't care how much darkness is in your life. When the word of God comes in, darkness has to leave. The light begins to shine. Your marriage may be hanging by a thread tonight, but it only takes God a moment to get in there and renovate it and begin to build the structure of the word upon it and fix it and make it whole again. Sitting here tonight with no job, but you may be sitting here with no job tonight, but in six months making the most you've ever made because you've got word on God. You've got word that God's given you that he will, he will, that weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Your morning may produce for you the greatest season of your life that you've ever experienced. God doesn't need five years. He doesn't need ten years. He may renovate it tonight, and by the time you wake up tomorrow morning, there's something that just clicks in your mind, that by the Spirit of God, He gives you intuition and innovation and creative insight into what you need to do to create a tomorrow beyond your imagination. That's how good He is. Somebody say, fix it now. Come on. You know, I don't, I, sometimes we just got to be like, I don't have time for anybody to lay hands on me. I'm laying hands on myself in Jesus' name right now. Come on. You got to give your angels a reason to have charge over you. The angels will not respond unless it, they heed the voice of the word of God. You and I have got to speak the word of God to give them something to move on so that they can have charge over us. Come on, somebody. Send God's word forth and give them something to act on. Now, I don't know how long the devil's mess stayed like that, but God cleaned it up in five days. That'll preach. Satan has a big problem because he sinned in eternity because time was not created until Genesis 1.14. So that made it impossible for Satan to ever have a turnaround. He now becomes an eternal sinner. You know, time allows you to start over. Time's your friend. Time allows you to get up and know that his mercies are new every day. Time allows you to walk through a fresh season and close the door on a bad season. Time allows you to turn around. It allows you to flow in and out of the prophetic destiny of God in your life. Time is not your enemy. Time is your friend. And because you were, you were lost in time, you were able to be saved. But Satan sinned when there was no time. He rebelled when there was no time. He rebelled in eternity, and now he is eternally lost, and he's eternally a sinner. Have you ever wondered why Satan hates us so much? Because when you get up and start singing and worshiping, he knows that is something that he will never experience. He knows he's locked in darkness forever. When he sees the tears run down, the faces of God's people and, and you begin to give your testimony of what you used to be. But the blood of Jesus washed your life clean and picked you up and pulled you out and turned you in a different direction. He's hearing something that he knows he will never get to experience. He is lost and he's going to be lost forever and he will never know what it means to be touched by God, renewed by God. The Bible says that hell is reserved for Satan. So right now, he's the prince and power of the air. But when you open up your mouth and begin to decree and declare the goodness of God, darkness has to flee. Darkness has to make room for the word of God. That's why the word, the preceding word of God is so powerful because when you worship him, when you're speaking and decreeing the word of God, when you're praying over your life, darkness has got to back up and is the Satan is reminded of his place in hell. Somebody shout hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Because you came out of something that he can't get out of. Jesus came, and when Jesus came, he came to release power over the work of the devil. He came to reverse the work of rebellion and the work of sin, the work of being a lost created in Satan. He came to reverse it. Let me ask you, does what you're fighting have a name? Why don't you say his name? Because his name is above it. Lesser authority always yields, yields to greater authority. God gave Jesus a name that is above whatever the name is that you're wrestling with. 
So you've got to understand that when you invoke the name of Jesus into your problem, then your problem immediately has to bow because you've now brought in a greater authority. Philippians 2.19, for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, somebody say Jesus, at that name every knee will bow, and those that are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of the Father. I believe that Jesus wants you to bring his name into your situation, because his name has got to be exalted above every other name every other situation the psalmist said that God exalts above all things two things his name and his word because God is exalted above all things his name and what he says in fact he will stake his own name on what he says because when God had no one else to swear by he swore by himself Colossians 2 15 When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Can I have 15 minutes to wrap this up? Matthew 16, 19, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind, where? Shall be bound? Whatever you loose on earth. God said, don't ask me to bind it. Say, I got to bind it. He said, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Quit asking me to bind and loose things. He said, we have got to take authority. He said, if you stop it, I'll stop it. If you release it, I'll release it. This is where heaven responds to earth. I'm about to preach. A lot of people are waiting to get to heaven to do something, but heaven isn't moving until we do. Luke 10, 18, he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, principalities and powers, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Can I tell you that when Jesus died and rose again, the Bible says that he disarmed all the powers of hell and darkness and Satan. Can I tell you that when he came off that cross and came up out of the grave that God gave Jesus a name that is above every other name? that everything else in the world would bow and we've got to start using that name decreeing that name can I tell you that Jesus said now I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth I'm going to bind and whatever you loose on earth I'll loose in other words he said the power of my father the power that my father gave to me I will give it to you if you will use it the keys that he gave me I'll give it to you if you will use it and he said I give you authority over every demon over every principality and power over all witness and nothing shall by any means harm you how can God make it any clearer that we spend too much time running from stuff that has no power over our life so Jesus when he reversed the power he gave the church you and I he gave you rights why are we talking about this wrapping up this series because there's going to be a battle and a fight that you're going to have to have without having a church service. There's times when you go home and, man, you just got to have it out with yourself. Anybody ever have it out with God? You lose. And see, you need to be able to make God be able to back you up without a congregation around you because you've got the word of God flowing out of your mouth. So listen, God gave you the right to judge. We're talking about angels here. God gave you the right to judge. Psalm 149 verse 6, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. What sword? The word of God. It says, let them be armed with praise and word. Why? Psalm 149 verse 7 says, to execute vengeance or judgment on the nations and punishment on the peoples to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. He's talking about a spiritual conflict. He's not talking about a king in a castle. Verse 9. 
to execute on them the judgment written. This is an honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. He said, it is your honor to put Satan in his place. It is your honor to remind Satan he has no power. He has no authority. It is your high and distinct honor to remind him of that. And if you know someone who is in high conflict and worn out, you need to say, it would be my honor to grab your hand and to walk into your house and take authority over the enemy that stands against your household, that's coming against your body, coming against your mind and depressing you. This is your honor. Come on. Jesus didn't die and was raised again so that, the, that, that, that he would have power over the enemy. He already had that. He died and rose again so that you and I could know what it feels like and understand what it means to have that honor and remind Satan he has no power. God did not come and die on a cross so that he could regain power over the enemy. He never lost it. But man lost power over the enemy and he wanted you to have your power back so bad he left his place and became a man. And as a man died and rose again that went back to sit at the right hand of the Father, he said, now I'm giving you your authority back. Take your honor and cast out the enemy. I'm almost done. The Hebrew word prayer means judge or attachment. When I pray or I praise, there are two things going on. We're talking about the heavens and the conflict the battle that you can't see, where your angels are. When you pray, I don't care if it's, if it's a simple prayer. Jesus said, when you pray, he said, don't pray with meaningless repetition. Now, some of you grew up Catholic. And some of you, have a, you know, had a rosary. And you prayed around those beads. And it became a religious practice to you. Some of you were praying the same prayers over and over and over and over and over again. And a lot of the times you weren't even praying to your heavenly father as Jesus tells us. You were praying to Mary. I heard the Hail Marys before. Hail Mary. Mary don't have any power. Come on, y'all. <laughs> when you pray, and why does he say not to pray with meaningless repetition. Why does he say don't pray religious prayers? He is saying that because when you pray religious prayers, it's non-relational. Jesus wants prayer to be relational. That's why it's so hard sometimes. Because you're upset about where you are and what you're going through and you really want to pray. You really want to work on your relationship with God because you know it's going to take you to another level of faith. But you just don't feel like praying what you know in your spirit. You ought to pray because you know if you pray it, it's going to take you out of where you are. And then you don't have anything to complain about. You don't have anything to bicker about because God's taking you out of it. So I just ain't praying. <laughs> when you go into all that mess, most of the time that's a key indicator. That a lot of people don't pray very often because nobody talks to anybody like that. No, you know, oh, you know, oh. dear Heavenly Father, I come before you now as your true humble servant. Come on, y'all. Who prays like that? What do you pray like? I pray like, God, I need help now. I don't even have the words to say. I need you to show up right now. God, I need help. Help me. God, I need you to show up right now. We're going through it. If you don't show up, I'm going to lose my mind. I need peace. I need, I, need, I need some kind of vision. I need you to give me something, God. I'm waiting. That's how I talk to God. You know? You know God help me, right? So that's what my prayers sound like. I don't know about yours. So 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? He is saying, are you unable to judge the rights and wrongs of the small things in life, yet God is going to put you in charge of judging the whole earth? Verse 3, do you not know that we will judge the angels? How much more matters of this life, he says. Now when we pray, what is happening? I'm talking to God, yes. But remember, there's three heavens. There's the earth. There's the abode of God, the third heaven. Then there's the firmament where the conflict is. 
So while you're simply talking to God, there is a conflict in the firmament. The Bible says you've been given the right and ability to execute judgment. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Let a two-edged sword be in their hand. That's big. How many of you know that culture is what comes normal to people? When you talk about somebody's culture, it's what comes normal to them. But one cultural distinctive that we as a church have been operating in since the beginning of time, it's, you know, it's praise. Somebody say praise. Everybody, listen, everybody who knows about this house knows we love to praise. I've got the emails and the messages before. Hey, Pastor, I'd love to come to your church, but your worship's too long. If you just cut your worship down, be shorter. I'd love to come to church. I'm like, go find somewhere else. So, you know, we, we, we leave time and, and, and you know, I, I, never mind. I just, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. But, but we want to leave time for the, for the moving of God's spirit to, to do what the Holy Spirit needs to do. You know, so for some people, if you're at your cubicle and you get up out of your cubicle or you just sit back at your desk and you're just or someone walks up on you at your desk and you're just you're praying in your spirit. They don't think you're crazy. You're nuts. People can look at churches like ours that are demonstrative in their praise and demonstrative in their worship and say, it doesn't take all that. People who think they would be wise about God look at worship as foolishness. But the Bible says that God takes our foolishness and it's wisdom to him. So you may look at somebody's praise and say, man, that's over the top. That's crazy. But what you don't see is what is taking place on their behalf because they were willing to lose themselves in a place. I would rather look normal to God than look normal to somebody else in this room. Come on. Ask David. David will tell you, I'd rather look normal to God than care what somebody thinks while I'm dancing down the street. Dancing in the street, right? They, you know, that's David, right? But, I'm just teasing. But while our praise may look ridiculous to some, it's normal in heaven. And I would rather look like what heaven wants me to look like than what somebody else wants me to be. So the Bible says that the high praises of God be in their mouth to execute judgment. You know another reason Satan hates you? It's not just because you are redeemed and he never will be. It's because all of you get to praise every time. Uh, you know, you get to praise. He's reminded that he lost his job. He's reminded of what happened because he was the minister of music in heaven. And when you lift up your hands and say, I can't help but praise you, he's reminded that he was displaced and you and I have been put in his place. When I lift up my hands and I say thank you, Jesus, when I lift up my hands and lift up a shout, he's reminded of the job that he lost. And I'm now standing in this place bringing worship to my God, and I'm in the place he used to be. He will never get his job back. Why? Because I will never let there be a time where I refuse to praise him. And even if there's a time when I go silent, God's created a backup plan in the trees and the rocks. Somebody is going to give God praise, but I'm not going to let a rock cry out in my place. When you're tired, you still got to praise him. When you want to stay in the bed, you've got to get up and praise him. When you're angry, you've got to learn to praise through it. Because the thing that's coming against you, you are putting judgment out when you praise. I don't care if you've got tears running down your face. I don't care if you're old. I don't care if you're young. God has given praise within your spirit. And when you open up your mouth and begin to decree the word of God, you are giving the angels permission to take the word of God and work on your behalf. Somebody shout angels go. Come on somebody. I'm done. I got two minutes. I got three minutes. Two minutes on my iPad. Three minutes back there. I gotta go quick. <laughs> listen, listen to this. Listen to this. Listen, 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 listen. Jacob, after praying, saw a vision, right? He saw a ladder. He saw angels ascending and descending. All the way back in Genesis, not only did prayer and praise execute demonic judgment, but it brought attachment to the angels. So in other words, Jacob got a vision. Your prayer is releasing those that are on your side and executing those that are against you. Hear me. 
It amazes me that not many people preach on prayer anymore and everybody is fighting such horrendous battle. We can come into a service like this and, 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 and praise God with passion. And if God opened up your eyes to the conflict that was happening six inches above your head, we couldn't take what was happening in this room right now. Because that praise, that, that worship that we had just a few minutes ago let off spiritual nuclear bombs in this room. Come on. You don't understand because of that moment, that in, the, the integrity and the purity in worship that it unlocks and unleashes victories that will begin to break out in your life because you executed judgment. That's why you can't ever let the enemy have your praise. So there is a judgment against my enemy. There's an attachment to the angelic realm. So my prayer creates an opening and has dual activity at the same time. While I'm putting the enemy under my feet where the honor is yours to do it. Quit waiting on God to do what he gave you and I the authority to do. God gave you the power and the authority over your enemy. But you've got to know your weapons and how to access them. So God takes the foolishness of my praise. And people looking at you like you're crazy for singing and dancing and worshiping and shouting. But Psalm 103, 20 says, Bless the Lord, you, his angels, mighty in strength, you who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. They don't obey a voice. They obey the voice that speaks his word. Listen, those that refuse to praise and treat it like it's a space filler on a Sunday morning, they stay under that darkness. But as for me and my house, I'm willing to act like a fool. Amen. I'm willing to get crazy for God. I'm willing to sing and clap and shout. I refuse to let my house operate under that kind of oppression. Some of you are this close to pushing through the final barrier, the final place, and angels are about to move on your behalf. So you've got to wake up in the morning. If you need deliverance, you say, angels of deliverance, we release you. Angels of prosperity right now, we release you. Angels of healing, we release you in this room right now. Angels of peace right now. In this moment at 8.30 on Wednesday night, we release you. Angels of joy right now, we release you. Angels of peace right now. Now, come upon this place. You've got to begin to decree and declare. And we come against every force of darkness and release those that are on heaven's side. Somebody shout, angels, go. Come on, somebody. Come on, stand right now. You have no idea the victory that is coming up upon you right now. Somebody say, angels, go. Angels, go. Angels, go. Angels, go. Angels, go. Like a rush 
Father, we thank you that you've given us all power. You've given us all authority, Lord. We decree and declare. And as we do, the angels move. And Father, we thank you that angels are moving right now on our behalf because of your faithfulness and your goodness to us to redeem us and set us free, God. We thank you that we can worship you and praise you in spirit and in truth for those are the ones you are seeking so father we thank you for all that you're doing we thank you father for what's about to be poured out in this generation we thank you for what you're about to do in your people we bless you we honor you we magnify you and we say have your way in every heart in every life jesus we give you all the honor we give you all the glory and we give you all the praise and everybody in this place say amen. And amen and amen. We'll see you Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. It's going to be incredible. Bring somebody with you.